Good evening, everyone, um, and uh, thanks for uh, coming over tonight. Uh, just by show of hands, I'd like to kind of see how many people here are already time members. Okay, almost everyone it looks like. Uh, how many people have uh, attended more than three events this year? Okay. All right, so I think uh, I'm going to give you a task this week. <laughs> and that is, please go and tell your friends to become time members. And why that is important is because, uh, you know, this organization, i.e. Thai, runs on three pillars. Membership, which is everyone in this room, and then charter members, which are people who contribute their time, give money, energy, help the entrepreneur ecosystem, and then sponsorship, which really pays for the bills. So membership really doesn't pay for the bills. Membership is something which sort of says, okay, when we have an event, uh, you know, we actually are serving the membership community to make sure that the entrepreneurial ecosystem is served, which is the goal of time. How do we foster entrepreneurship? How do we help the entrepreneurs? And uh, so uh, I just want to make a request to every one of you that please, Go recruit at least one new friend to become a Thai member this year. You have till December 31st, so <laughs> we are probably going to send each one of you an email. And if I send Terry on that task, she, he will probably make sure that you get bombarded with emails. <laughs> so before we do that, just make sure that at each one of you bring one member into the organization. So that will be great. The reason I'm saying that is because we're running a membership drive until the end of the year and we need your help. We don't want to resort to mass mailing and things like that, but instead we think that you, our membership community, would be the best people to talk to your friends who may benefit from it. Uh, a little thing that you probably know everything about Thai since you are a member, but I thought I will talk about some of the new things that are happening in, uh, in Thai. Uh, so uh, many of you are familiar with Thai angels, I'm assuming, right? Yes? Okay. Uh, we also had a program that we started a while ago, which you probably get emails on called VC One on One for people who are looking for funding and you get to sit in front of a VC, ask your kind of do your dry run presentation ahead of time uh, rather than going directly in front of them in a formal way. So that's another uh, thing that if you want to avail of it, uh, feel free to follow that email trail and do the action that I needed. Uh, the other thing that uh, we felt the need for, and it is going to be announced next week, is we are starting an incubator uh, called Thai Launchpad. And Thai Launchpad is a little different than many of the other incubators in a lot of ways, and in some ways it is similar. It is kind of modeled after the Y Combinator model, only to an in spirit in the sense that there will be classes uh, for five months. So you have like every group that comes in will be there for about five months. And you have to, if you are interested to apply for that, you know, website has, I think, most of the information. And if not, by next week, all the information will be there. And essentially, if you get accepted, so first of all, we're only interested, in, this particular launch pad is only interested in looking at B2B companies. We're not interested in people who are building consumer facing only apps. People who are building business to business apps uh, or technologies are the ones that are going to be given preference for this. And a lot of the Thai charter members have contributed money, so there is about a $5 million into the fund. And initially, when you sign up, you get $50,000. And uh, you get about five months of, you know, uh, basically training as well as you are given a dedicated mentor that you get to select from uh, various Thai mentors and if the mentor and mentee both agree with each other then you get that person as your advisor and in return for all these efforts Thai takes about 3% of the equity um, 
which then the goal really is this is a convertible, so you get essentially they help you also do the next level of fundraising, they help you get the validation of customers and other things that are needed really to be ready for funding. So anyone is interested, if you have not applied and you want to apply, uh, now will be the time. I believe October 31st is the last date for applying for the first session, which is going to start beginning of January. Okay. Any questions so far before we get started with today's session? So, okay. So, uh, you know, today we, we have uh, the honor of having um, uh, Ravi Venkateshan, who has come uh, from India. In fact, uh, he's still jet lagged. And so, uh, so hopefully uh, he didn't want to eat so that he doesn't sleep through the presentation. <laughs> and uh, it is everyone's job here to make sure that he stays up, which means you got to be involved. And uh, after a brief presentation from him uh, and a few questions uh, from the stage, we will open it up to the audience so you can have uh, the questions. And uh, if your questions are uh, well liked, uh, you will you may actually get his book autographed by him. So that's up to you. So we will see that. So just a quick uh, background uh, for Ravi, and you know he has been uh, the uh, Microsoft. Uh, India chairman from 2004 to 2011 and uh, before uh, joining Microsoft um, as the chairman of Cummins India he led this transformation to the country's uh, leading provider of uh, power solutions and engines and, and the part that really stuck me when uh, Ravi says hey I'm not a high-tech guy I'm, I'm, I'm a business guy and uh, actually in fact in his background he's not just involved with Microsoft but even uh, you know, he's on the uh, board of director for AB Volvo, Infosys, and member of advisory board of uh, Bungie Limited, and he also serves on the Harvard Business School's Global Alumni Board, and obviously he's a celebrated author. I think uh, I have seen a couple of people who actually bought his book and who are here uh, because of that as well. So with that, uh, let me welcome Ravi to the stage, and uh, he'll do a brief presentation and then after that we'll have a small q a on the panel but um, and then after that we'll open up to the audience Ravi. thank you let's welcome let's give him a i went back to india in 1996 and between 96 and you know it was funny i never thought i'd stay this long i put my stuff in storage and every quarter i would renew the uh, the arrangement because i wasn't sure when i would come back and it was after four years that I decided this is home. So anyway, over between 96 and 2011, I had the great good fortune of helping build not one, but two billion dollar businesses, first around engines and generator sets and things, glamorous things like that. And then by complete accident, I got hired by Microsoft and it was a very unlikely thing because uh, you know I certainly don't think of myself as a technologist. In fact, uh, when I, when I was being uh, headhunted, uh, my uh, my secretary used to print my email and give it to me in a folder. And I would, you know, mark it up and throw it back at him next morning. And so, when the, when, I, when these guests came out of the woodwork and said, "Would you like to sort of uh, leave Microsoft in India?" I thought it was a big joke, but anyway, it worked out well. Uh, but what I realized is that the success of these companies is actually an aberration. Uh, the vast majority of foreign companies, multinational companies, struggle mightily in India. And most uh, M, you know, global companies, actually what I call in the book, part of a 1% club. And 1% club means your market share in India is 1%. And India continues to contribute 1% or less to the global revenues and profits. <laughs> and these are not badly run companies. These are not the kinds of people you might ridicule. They include... Apple, GE, Toyota, Caterpillar, just fantastic companies, okay? So there's something quite serious going on here if such companies are struggling to you know, have, gain a toehold here. And it's actually a lose-lose situation. So A, they're, uh, they're losing out on the, on the opportunity in India. More importantly, they're giving up in frustration and India's losing out on foreign investment, the job creation, the technology and management know-how. 
that they bring, which is why I decided to <clears throat> look at this issue and write a book. Now, most there's some reasons why this is, you know, ex to some extent it's explainable. India is a f you know, extraordinarily hard market for every company, Indian and foreign. So that's one. Second is most people are so obsessed by China that they sort of completely overlook the India opportunity. Uh, that's happening as well. But what was interesting is, if the market is tough, it's equally tough for everyone. So the question is, why have a handful of companies managed to do so spectacularly well here? And that's what really interested me, right? So for instance, why do Korean companies like LG, Samsung, and Hyundai always do better than their Japanese or American counterparts? Okay, that's quite peculiar. How did an obscure a construction equipment company out of the UK called JCB end up with 65% market share in India and you know, just crushed Caterpillar, which is typically the 800 pound gorilla of its industry everywhere. And India now contributes somewhere between 35 and 50% of their global profits. Okay, so very, very substantial. And then I like McDonald's because, you know, McDonald's is very inspiring. This is the largest reseller of beef and beef products in the world. They come to a country which is pretty much still vegetarian, where the cow is sacred, one dollar is a lot of money. And they create this fantastic, fast-growing chain of restaurants. So, and if McDonald's can do it, why can't Apple do it? You know? So that, that was fairly intriguing. So this is why I decided to pursue uh, the, uh, and, write, and write, write this book. Today, though, I'm going to talk about three things, just three questions, because uh, we're limited in time. And the first is, does India still matter? Okay? And that's a very, very important question, and as it's a largely Indian audience, and I hope you're all asking yourself that question. The second is, what does it really take to succeed? Because in the same difficult markets, as I said, some handful of companies have done really well. And why is success so rare? Let's start with why India, does India still matter? You know, in, uh, I wrote a piece in uh, Times of India last week, and I said India's fall from grace has been precipitous, hero to zero in four years. Oh and it has been. Four years ago, India was celebrated because we had sprung back from the fiscal crisis of 2008. In 2009, we were growing at, at about 9.5%, 10% for at least a couple of quarters. And of course, we were hallucinating, saying we're going to surpass China. <laughs> and, and four years later, there's almost no good news coming out of the country, right? It's scandal after scandal, rape capital of the place, of the world, uh, you know, just absolutely no good news. And obviously, many, many, many companies are beginning to really sort of get concerned about investing in India. And of course, Indian CEOs are also saying, listen, the opportunities are much better outside. And there are a whole set of reasons which have made India a spectacularly hard place to do business, and I've listed those out there. And Dave Cody of Honeywell really speaks for wow. lots of others. He's a little bit more blunt than others. But he says, uh, my board says I ought to have my head examined every time I take an investment proposal to them. So in this sort of backdrop, why does India still matter? So, you know, the, uh, and this is a critical question. So one is, I think the long-term thesis is still intact. And the long-term thesis is fundamentally demographics, okay? And this chart says, I think, something quite important. This is from OECD, and it says, even if you, say, uh, you know, assume India's GDP is going to grow only at 6% a year, not 9 and 10 like it did for a while, it's going to contribute disproportionately to the growth in middle class consumption. Okay? Just, and this is just large numbers and demographics. And so if you're an FMCG company, you know, a consumer products company, consumer durables company, a car manufacturer, a handset manufacturer, soap or any one of these types of companies, this is incredibly important. It says you can't overlook India without consequences. And if you're an industrial, a B2B type company selling to them, again, that's pretty important. Now, this one is a really, really important slide. And it's one, when I get depressed, <laughs> think of, you know, this one gives me some hope and confidence. Why? This basically plots India's GDP growth in a very simple way 
from independence till today. And what you can see is a you know, reasonable growth. And why is this encouraging? To me, it's encouraging because in these 60 years, we've had some spectacularly bad governments, and we've toyed with some really bad ideas on how to run the economy. And yet, India has moved forward. Two steps forward, one step back, but generally forward. Now, is there a lot of missed opportunity here? Absolutely yes, right? Because in 1960, our economy was ahead of South Korea, um, Singapore, and China. And today, you know, we trail all of them by a big, big, big margin. But it, what, what it does say is our India's growth model is fundamentally different from that of East Asia. Those countries progressed because uh, they were, the, the development model was driven by the government. Government policies, government investment. India's progress has happened despite the government. Okay? In fact, uh, I'm told there's this author, Gurcharan Das, who's speaking tonight in a different part of the city. But he wrote a decent book a year ago, and the title of the book was India Grows at Night. And the subtitle is, While the Government Sleeps. So, you know, um, the good news here is our growth is driven by young people, their ambitions, their desire for consumption, entrepreneurship, particularly of our, you know, lots of um, firms and so forth. But, uh, yeah, and therefore there is precious little that even a bad government can do to completely kill it. The other good thing that has happened over the last decade is as the center has weakened, the states have become more powerful, more autonomous. And so what you're seeing is some of the states are actually quite well governed. So you could take a state like Orissa, it's been growing at 10, 11% a year. Bihar has come, finally woken up and it's been growing off a very low base at 14% CAGR. Gujarat has also been doing almost double digits. So it is no longer useful to talk about India in sort of some collective sense. It's much like, much more like Europe, it's a continent. And you have to differentiate the performance at the level of states. And if you're a company, you have to think about where you invest in a more, more targeted fashion. So this is a generally, I think, hopeful picture. This slide's also quite important. You know, somewhere uh, people have got sort of seduced by the, the uh, development of China. And, you know, it's been this extraordinary growth there over 20 years of, you know, almost smooth, uh, linear growth. <laughs> But that's not how most economies develop. So I look back over 50 years, and this is just a picture over three. In every decade, you have three or four years of growth, of decent growth, and it's sandwiched between six or seven really tough years. Okay? And that's the reality of how development actually happens. It happens in spurts rather than in this smooth, continuous fashion. And so what it says is, if you're a company, Indian or foreign, what you need to do is hang in there during the tough times like what we're going through right now. And when growth comes back, you run really fast. And if you do that over two or three cycles, you actually end up having a good business. The companies that don't do well are the ones that who, who get disheartened during moments like this. And they pause, they give up, they quit, and so forth. So, Basically, the, so the point I'm making is that an economy that's one and a half trillion to two trillion dollars, depending on where the conversion rate is, the exchange rate is, growing at 6% with our kind of demographics, still has reasonable medium and long-term prospects. So that's one reason why I think India still is relevant. The second is, you know, uh, paradoxically, chaos. Um, I use the word chaos in the book as shorthand for everything that makes life difficult. Bad government, uncertainty of policies, crazy amounts of volatility, corruption, bad infrastructure, everything that makes life tough. And the conclusion I've reached is chaos is not unique to India. It's actually a defining feature of every emerging market. That's why they're called emerging. Okay? So take a thing like corruption. Right? So this organization called Transparency International puts up every year the rankings of countries. And India does really badly, as it should. Okay? It's number 92, and it's a terrible, terrible place from a point of view of corruption. And I'm not letting the government off the hook. But 
<clears throat> and, and therefore it's glowing kind of orange. But take a look at that map. It says, it says the US and Canada are pretty okay. Western Europe's a pretty nice place, particularly as you go north into Scandinavia. Uh, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand are pretty reasonable places. But the rest of the world is a mess. You start from Russia, go to China, Mongolia, come down to India, go down to Malaysia, Indonesia, etc. Keep going uh, west to Central Asia, to Africa, South America. All of these are corrupt places. What does it tell you? If you're a global company, you really don't have much of a choice. The growth is in these places. And you can't say, I'll come back to India when they're less corrupt, okay? Or Brazil, or China, or any of these places. Because it might be a very long time. What you have to do is figure out how to grow successful businesses in these markets in a way that is you know, congruent with your values and your home country laws. And in some cases that's possible, in some cases it's not. That might be a good question at the end, uh, if you want a book, copy of the book. <laughs> now, here's another one. This chart shows the ease of doing business, which World Bank again publishes every year. And India does very badly. We're ranked number 132 out of 200 countries. Okay, a seriously tough place. And but nothing has really changed. In 1962, there was this wonderful American ambassador to India called John Kenneth Galbraith. The older members of the audience here may recognize that name. Yeah. But you know, he described India as a functioning anarchy. Okay, <laughs> in 2013, uh, it feels pretty much the same. Pretty much the same. But India is number 132. But again, look at uh, the other major emerging markets. Number 130 is Brazil, number 131 is Indonesia, Nigeria is like 160, etc. China is slightly better, I think they're about 90-something. So again and again, what I found was India, in, with all its chaos, is in fact highly representative of most emerging markets. And it has one thing that most of them lack, which is huge potential, a huge depth of talent. And so India is an archetype, and, you, and if you succeed here, you can probably succeed in many other places. Which brings me to this third point. What I found is the handful of companies that persevered and finally made a success of it in India ended up developing the muscles, the capabilities, the products, the business models, which served them well, not just in India, but traveled well as, as they went across many other markets. And here's some pretty good examples of this. That green tractor, the, you know, in the corner, that's from Deere and Company, the old John Deere. And you know, John Deere never paid attention to small tractors. <coughs> and as a result, they had no business at all in places like India or Africa or, uh, why? The average Deere machine is bigger than an Indian farm. Okay. And this didn't matter for a while until one day uh, uh, Mahindra and Mahindra took out these front page ads in the US saying, hey, this was about six years ago, saying, Mr. Deer, we are number one. They had basically beaten Deer in terms of units oh. to become the largest tractor manufacturer in the world. So these guys finally woke up in Moline and they decided they needed to do something. And they sent a team down to India and they developed finally a very competitive 35 horsepower tractor which gained about 8 9% share in India, but now is exported from India to 65 countries around the world. Wow. Okay, so this idea that once you succeed here, you can actually take things you develop to other markets. This one was actually, is a Cummins generator set, which uh, was developed uh, by the company under my uh, tenure. So I was uh, running Cummins in India, and the whole bottom fell out of the market in 2000. There was just absolutely no movement, sort of like today. And so we were quite desperate for growth. But then uh, some of our people noticed that at that time India was setting up a new cell phone tower every 15 minutes or so. And each one of them had a generator set. There was a mall that was coming up in India every week. And they needed lots of generator sets. The problem was these were small gen sets, typically below about 150 kVA. And Cummins didn't have any product in that range. 
but we were little radicals, so we said, listen, let's go to our competitors and buy engines and package them into these cute little generators. And pretty soon we had a profitable $100 million business. And one day the chairman came down to India and we proudly showed it to him and he said, listen, who approved this? So we said, gosh, we forgot. <laughs> we forgot we had to ask for permission, but now it's a $100 million profitable business. So he did the only thing he could, he made it a global business. So today, if you buy one of these small gen sets in Europe or uh, the, U the US from Cummins, it's made in Pune. So like this, you can find examples like that Unilever water filter, which was developed, which is now part of uh, their global business. That sun silk shampoo sachet is a very interesting thing, right? About 25 years ago, you, an Indian company called Cavan Care in uh, Chennai came up with the idea that of a single-use sachet for shampoo, oil, soaps, etc. And Unilever copied that and did really well. And they took it to other emerging markets and it did really well. But that's not the really interesting thing. In January, Paul Polman, their CEO, said the fastest growing markets for single-use sachets is where? It's in Portugal, Greece, uh, and uh, Spain. Okay? Because as these countries have had their incomes really hit, suddenly these kinds of things make a lot of sense. So again and again I found that once these companies sort of cracked the code to success in India, they found there was a whole host of markets that they could succeed in, taking the same products or managers and so on and so forth. Therefore, bottom line, India is going through a horrible, nightmarish patch right now. It's, you know, it's unclear when that's going to end, but despite it all, it's, you cannot overlook this market without consequences. A, it's a one and a half trillion dollar economy growing at 5%, super, hopefully back to 6%, that's reasonable. Second, chaos is a defining feature. If you're a global company, learn to deal with it. And most of all, treat India as a lab to cook up your emerging market model and take it and replicate that in many other parts of the world. So that's kind of thesis number one. Now I want to turn my attention to the really interesting question. Why is it in the same extraordinarily difficult market, 50 companies have done so spectacularly well? First of all, what is it, what is spectacularly well? Right? Spectacularly well doesn't mean you met budget, which is how many companies define it. It's actually, you know, your number, you're a leader in your industry in India, you're growing faster than everybody else, particularly local competition. Number two, how much of your global growth is coming from India, right? In a, in a given year, say you added, whatever, $100 million of new profit. How much of it came from India? How much came from China? How much came from the US? If India is not contributing at least 10%, yeah, you've still got work to do. And finally, how are you leveraging what you've done in India in other markets? And when you apply these criteria, there's a set of companies that you know, do this generally remarkably well. And these are brands you recognize. Now, what's interesting is there's no pattern at all. These are, you know, they're Korean companies, Japanese companies, American companies, Germans, UK, Swedish. And they're across multiple industries. So you can't just say the consumer guys win. It's banking, technology, consumer products, automotive, the works. What is common across them at the end of the day actually turns out to be how they think and how they approach markets like India. So here's what these companies do that's profoundly different from how the rest operate. And the first is the mindset. Now most companies look at a country, at any market, whether it's India or Brazil or Indonesia, as just one more incremental place to go sell whatever they produce, whether it's a car, whether it's a phone, or, or anything else. And so what do they do? They replicate their global product, same prices, same management processes, the same budgeting process, and they therefore go nowhere. In, with these companies, somewhere in their trajectory, some CEO woke up and said, listen, we better think strategically. That me, with how can we be a global company if we are not a leader in a handful of markets around the world? How can we be global if we are not a leader in China? How can we be global if we are not a leader in India and Indonesia and Brazil? 
you know, the large markets with large populations. So no matter how long it takes, even if it takes us 10 years to get there, we're going to persevere and, and get to a leadership position. That's a fundamentally different logic. And therefore, what these companies do is take a long-term perspective to the game. So take McDonald's. You know, McDonald's opened in India in 1996 with their first restaurant in Bangalore, and it was a miserable failure. Okay, not surprising, because if you just replicate the U.S. model, uh, you'll get a few expats showing up, but that's about it. <clears throat> Over the next eight years, they, they didn't open many restaurants. I think there were hardly four. But what they worked on was the menu. What they figured out is, you know, the Indian potatoes, while we grow a lot of potatoes, don't make good fries. So they flew in agronomists from Idaho who lived in India and figured out how to grow the right kind of potatoes. Lettuce is not indigenous to the Indian diet. Okay, so they had to figure out how do you grow lettuce and get it from, <laughs> get it to all these uh, cities. They had to figure out how do you make money when the average price point on a Happy Meal menu is what, 50 cents or less? And they, this took them eight years. During this eight years, they invested a hundred million dollars. Okay, how many companies out there would invest hundred million dollars without year after year without seeing a return? But then one day they cracked the code, and then the next 350 restaurants happened in the, in the four or five years, and now they're on their way to 500 and and so on. So it is. We, the willingness to take, play this very, very long-term game because you're absolutely determined to be a leader in the market. This commitment is the single most important differentiator between you know, phenomenal success and mediocrity. The other aspects of mindset are, are, are there as well, but I won't touch it much on them. For instance, humility. There are a heck of a lot of companies, particularly American companies, that believe they know the formula for success. They've succeeded in America, they've succeeded in Europe, and now all they have to do is replicate that model. And if it's not working, it's obviously the leadership team in India that's at fault. And we have to change them, not the model. And that's, there's a certain amount of arrogance in that, right? Because you assume that you know it all, and you know all bright people live in headquarters, and the people in China, India, etc., all these markets simply have to do what they're told and success is guaranteed. The companies that succeed actually are those that come with a lot more humility, a willingness to adapt, a willingness to say, hey, listen, we're going to teach them many things, but we, perhaps we can also learn a few things and take that back. So this spirit of humility turns out to be quite important. So that's mindset. The second most important thing is uh, a willingness to change your model, your products for the market, rather than waiting for the market to adapt to you. And I'll give you two good examples right from this industry, from this part of the world. Apple. It mystified me that Apple has a 2% market share of phones in India, right? Because so, everybody wants an iPhone. Who doesn't? Almost everybody. Um, and, you know, I tried to reach Tim Cook, he refused to respond to my email, so I never got to interview him or anybody else from, from Apple. But the answer became sort of crystal clear in October last year, when at, at an analyst meeting, they, he got pounded for saying, why are you ignoring emerging markets? Why are you abdicating all these places? And he said, listen, India, I love India, but it's not important. And it's not important because the distribution system there is very inefficient, there aren't modern electronic retail shops, and we'd have to build Apple stores, and that's very expensive. And frankly, there aren't enough rich Indians okay, who can afford our products. And those rich Indians, anyway, they buy their iPhones in San Francisco, New York, Dubai, Singapore, whatever. So one day, it's going to be an important place, but not right now. Well, good logic, except two things went wrong for Apple. One is their major competitor, Samsung, decided to play very different game. So they, you know, develop products at different price points. They built out the distribution system, etc. The other thing that went wrong for Apple is India became the third largest uh, smartphone market in the world. It's China number one, U.S. number two, and India is number three. And so as a result, Apple has two percent market share by units uh, in India, and Samsung has forty percent. Even if you look by value, 
Apple share just doubles to 4 or 5%. They're relevant. Now they're desperately trying to claw back share. And so what is the takeaway here? If you don't adapt your model and you wait for the country to catch up with your model, there's a lot of danger and risk. There's a different example from my Microsoft days, a thing that you know, we got reasonably right. In 2004 when I joined, one of the biggest challenges the company faced was software piracy. People liked using Windows and Office, but only one out of four people paid for it. And as long as Bill Gates was the chairman, that wasn't a problem. He had this very long-term view. He said, listen, get, get lots of people using it, and one day we'll collect. <laughs> now, um, yes, some of the Microsofties here are laughing. Then he retired, and his successor was a much more impatient man. He was you know, this passionate guy who liked to throw chairs at people who didn't deliver the numbers. <laughs> so he said, no, this is the time to collect. Is that the person experience? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so he said, no, this is the time to collect, so enough of all these excuses, get on with it. So of course in China and India we started talking about copyright, intellectual property, uh, licensing and compliance and all that. It went nowhere, we just pissed off all our customers. And then in 2005, uh, the IT minister called me, it was uh, Dayan Oh, Dayan And so he explained to me in Tamil, Okay, he said, listen, you seem like a nice guy, but you're a bit stupid. So, so, so let me give you some friendly advice. He says, in India, copyright means the right to copy. <laughs> so he says, good luck to you. You, you know, you're going to be long gone from Microsoft, long gone from the planet before the, you know, the, the value system of, of, of the country changes. So if Microsoft wants to be successful, you need to think about how your business model changes. Fortunately, uh, you know, the company sort of listened and woke up. And over the next three, four years, through experimentation, we implemented a model called differential pricing. It's not what we called it, but that's really what it is. Differential pricing is that you charge people different amounts of money for roughly the same thing based on their ability to pay. So if you ask a Microsoft sales guy today, what's the price for office in India? Well, no, it's not because he or she is incompetent. It depends on who you are. <laughs> so if you're, a, if you're a large company, it's $300. If you're a mid-size or small company, it's $65. If you're a school or a college or a university, it's $2.50 per year. If you're a not-for-profit organization, it's free. If you're government, if you buy the local language version, it's next to nothing. So for roughly the same bits, you're charging a huge amount of, you know, a hugely different amounts of money. And it turned out to be very, very, very successful. Now, why is this important? Because it illustrates that principle. You adapt to the market rather than waiting for the country to change to fit your model, right? And today, which other industry has the same problem? Pharmaceuticals, mm -hmm. right? Because they've got the same issue. They invest $600 million, a billion dollars, bringing some life-saving anti-cancer drug to the market. They want to recover it in 20 years, so they charge a bomb. That's fine if you're wealthy, but in a country where 800 million people live on $2 a day or less, you can't afford that. And it's very difficult for any government, particularly a democratically elected government, to say the value of a human life depends on how much they earn. It's a non-starter. And so you get into the mode of compulsory licensing, price control, which these guys hate. But the answer is probably in terms of bending your model in this way. So that's kind of number two. Number three is these companies fundamentally think differently about the talent model. In most companies, the, you know, the sales uh, part of the organization is headed by a junior salesperson based on the size of the business. <coughs> Okay? You never get anywhere with that. The other day, day, somebody was asking me, you know, oh, you work closely with Bill Gates. I said, it wasn't close. You had close encounters from time to time. <laughs> but if there's one thing I learned from him, it was the approach to talent management. Really, this is the single most important lesson I learned, which is you, you know, hire talent based on the size of your ambition, not based on the size of the business. 
If you have a $10 million business, you don't hire a $10 million sales leader. Okay? You hire a $100 million sales leader because that's the potential of the business. Okay? So in these companies, what you do is you staff the country based on the size of the, the, the opportunity that you see there. And it typically needs to be somebody you trust profoundly. Okay? Because you need to trust their integrity and their ethics. You also need to trust their judgment because in India you're not going to succeed by doing things the same way. You have to bend the model and you want to make sure that the person bending it is somebody you trust. You want somebody incredibly entrepreneurial. You want somebody who's willing to stay there for five to ten years. Nothing in India or China gets done in three years. Almost nothing. You can build a road in China and in India, of course, that will take 30. But any building anything subst sub substantive it's a five to ten year journey. And most of our companies, people get restless if they're in the role for more than two and a half years. Okay? So you need a very different type of person who is willing to stay long enough to do something useful. So I was, in each of my roles, I was there for seven years. My successor in Cummins is, you know, ten years and even longer. JCP, the same thing. McDonald's, the same thing. So you need people who have this sort of long-term orientation who, who are institution builders. You also need to be able to you know, grow your own talent. Unlike here, you can't just go out and hire smart people who you know, have got great experience in A, B, or C. You have to, you've got lots of smart people, but they don't have the maturity, the expertise, the experience. And so you have to invest, invest, invest in growing the talent from within. And if you aren't willing to make that investment, you're somewhere, and you have a revolving door of talent, you're never going to get anywhere. So these are the three things that fundamentally set those companies apart. So final question before I turn it back to you. Hey, this sounds reasonably simple and obvious. Why don't more companies do it? You know, sorry? It's not simple. In a certain sense, it doesn't sound sort of all that hard. But the working title of my book when I started writing it was called Winning in India. And, you know, that was January 2011. In February 2011, my heart sank. McKinsey came out with a free paper called Winning in India. Mm. And I was sure these guys had hacked my machine. <laughs> okay, and it had a lot of the same things. The point is, nothing changed, right? And so McKinsey's advice is free, BCG's advice is free. This is all reasonably common sense. Our comp companies aren't acting on it. They're not stupid. They're filled with really smart people. And so the final conclusion I came to is, hey, this stuff is an unnatural act. Okay? Because look what, you're, what advice you're give, I'm giving uh, these business leaders and CEOs. You know, ignore all the noise that you're hearing about India. Ignore everything that you bad that you're reading in the uh, in the press, seeing on television and in the internet, and bet instead on the country and its long-term potential, its demographics, its talent, and so forth. Oh, sacrifice profitability in the short term for market leadership. Even though your business in India is tiny, send one of your most senior, most accomplished leader and leave them there for five to ten years. Okay. In most multinational companies, you can't even order a pencil without somebody outside India approving it, you know, in Singapore or Hong Kong or whatever. Here you're saying, no, give most operating decisions, allow the local team to, to make those. Each one of these things is an unnatural act, okay? And therefore, unless the CEO passionately believes this, it doesn't change. The bureaucracy in the middle doesn't change these behaviors. And CEOs are unwilling to, to do things differently in India right now, okay? Because look at, look at the chaos. And they've got other opportunities, most importantly, a fast reviving United States. The second is the average tenure of a you publicly, uh, the CEO of a publicly listed American company is now down to five and a half years. Mm -hmm. And here you're saying, hey, the, uh, make investments with a time horizon of five to eight years even. So you're basically telling the CEO, you take all the risk. If it's successful, your successor is going to take all the credit for it. And not many people are excited about that. And the reality is most American leaders and European leaders have no experience living and working in these kinds of markets, not just India, any of these markets. 
and therefore they're uncomfortable in these situations. China is sort of okay because it's got a user-friendly sort of interface, right? You've got the shiny infrastructure and the five-star hotels and so on and so forth. India is a pretty rough place. Um, <clears throat> so guess what happens? Nothing. It's business as usual. And the problem with this is there are consequences. And the consequence is that a new set of companies which are actually betting big on these difficult markets and executing well are rapidly closing uh, the gap with, with the industry leaders, in some cases surpassing them. I'll give you an example of this. Volvo. I've been on their board since 2007. And when I joined the board of Volvo, which makes trucks, buses, and construction equipment, it was number three worldwide in trucks and sort of pretty down, far down the totem pole on construction equipment. Their CEO, Leif Johansson, decided to bet on India and China in particular. And unfortunately for him, 2008 hit. 80% of the business went away in four weeks. Okay, And so the board said, listen, we better do something radical out here and forget all these expansionary plans in Asia. Okay, let's just survive. He said, no, we'll cut in Europe, we'll cut in the US, but we're going to make these investments in India and China. And that's what he did. And so uh, in India, they bought 50% of uh, a truck manufacturer called Aisha. In China, we bought uh, into a company called Lingong, which makes construction equipment. And recently uh, bought 45% of Dongfeng Motors, their largest truck manufacturer. Today, Volvo's number one worldwide in trucks and number three in construction equipment, okay? And Caterpillar has rapidly lost ground. Just like Apple has lost ground to Samsung, Toyota has lost ground, Mercedes has lost ground, etc. So, it's not just about India. As I said, it's India representing a whole class of emerging markets. And the point is, if you sort of ignore this, there are consequences. It may be okay to ignore it, but you need to do it explicitly with your eyes open. So let me pause there and see if there are questions. Uh, I'll just say one thing. This, all this is slightly dated. Uh, this goes back to June. This is what the book talks about. In June, I, um, you know, I was going around the U.S. and particularly in New York, and the former American ambassador to India, Frank Wisner, said, listen, I buy all of this, but... Uh, you know, this is reasonable advice of multinational companies that don't really have a stake in Indian society. Okay? Because companies don't have a stake in countries. Okay? They're amoral, profit-seeking entities. So this is fine advice for them. But what about India and Indian society? And, you know, are you comfortable with giving the same advice, which is managed through the chaos? At what point will the chaos conquer India? And that was an eye-opening question. And since then, all my sort of energy, my own writing, and etc., has turned towards what's happening in the country. I'll just set that up as a teaser, and now I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Naresh Patra. Your quote over there, that India grows at night, while the government sleeps, should say India's population grows at night, uh, because they are all busy building babies. <laughs> Anyhow, India's population is supposed to grow to about 1.6 billion by 2050. Is that going to be a long-term asset or a liability? Given the chaos there is today is in India, I feel that's going to be the biggest, more liability and a chaos. What is your opinion? I agree entirely. The so-called demographic dividend has been beaten to death. And in theory, it's right. If you've got uh, you know, lots of young people, they're consuming, um, you know, and trying to, and they're highly driven, motivated, they have the skills and the education to be part of a product, globally productive workforce. You have a huge asset, but that's not how it's playing out. In fact, you know, India is, because of our demographics, there are 15 million people entering the workforce every year, or workforce age every year. Guess how many net new jobs we are creating? Okay? It's a tiny fraction of that. So, what you've got is ang growing anger amongst our youthful population.
and you see that in the rise of violence all across the country. So I, I, I think we should be dreadfully concerned about the uh, demographic disaster that's on our hands. Yeah. Hi, my name is Raj Bharat. Um, how do you practically run a business in India without engaging in corruption? And how do you adapt? Like you say, that's a good that question. Market? <laughs> I agree. That, that gets a book, <laughs> at least my nomination. <laughs> this, is, this is the single most frequent question I get outside India. In India, strangely, nobody asks that question. <laughs> <laughs> I just learned to adapt. <laughs> so my answer is this. There are certain industries where it is impossible to succeed without being corrupt. And those industries are where the government plays a substantial role either from a point of view of regulation, either or in the form of giving contracts, so think about municipal contracts for managing infrastructure, etc., or controlling access to natural resources like spectrum, coal, real land and real estate, etc. <coughs> so in these biz industries, corruption and bribery is an integral part of the business model, and it is impossible for any company, Indian or foreign, to succeed without bribing. I'm saying this on record, and I know it's going to get me in trouble, but that's the truth. And therefore, in my book, I say foreign companies need to stay out of this. Now, some of them foolishly believe that you can find an Indian partner who you can outsource this stuff to. <laughs> and that usually ends badly because the ethics of the Indian partner and you will collide. So take a nice Scandinavian company like Telenor from Norway. They come to India, they form a joint venture with an Indian real estate company that mysteriously has telecom licenses, okay? It ends badly, and now all these ones are in court. So, but that's, having said that, there's still half the economy where you can operate without too much bribery, okay? And that's consumer uh, businesses, b 2 B-type businesses. So bribery there is an option, but speed money may not be that much of an option. Now, even bribery is a challenge. If you notice, there's a huge amount of bribery that's come to light in China, okay? In pharmaceutical companies, uh, starting with GSK, and now it's spread all over, and then food companies like Danone and others. So if you want to operate in emerging markets without bribing, you have to do a set of things. The most important thing is, right, from the board to the CEO to the frontline employee, you have to be clear, this is how we do business. Now, you can't just have that as your policy statement. And then when the quarter comes, you start whipping people because they didn't meet the numbers, okay? Because then they will do bad things. What you have to realize is there is a consequence, a cost for doing business the right way. You will lose certain type of business. Certain approvals may take a lot longer to get than you would like. It may take you six months and not six days. And that's okay, because that's the kind of business we are. Eventually, if you stay with that approach, you build a reputation, and things work out quite fine. So, but this is a choice, that, and everybody from top to bottom has to understand that, okay? The, of course, you've got to do things like have you know, policies, processes, controls, audits, and all that stuff. But the single biggest antidote to bribery is actually your culture. And you have to build the right type of culture, which is in chapter eight of the book. So you can read that now that you have a copy. The, the more problematic thing for companies is not bribery. It's two kinds of problems. One is speed money, okay? That means the fellows should do his job you're not asking for any special favors, but it's not going to get done mm -hmm. if you don't pay it. And this is particularly true in customs. So you're importing Norwegian salmon, okay? By the fourth day, you're willing to do anything to get it through customs. <laughs> Very simple. Okay, so, the, well, so what do companies do? You employ an agent who's a you know, customs or freight clearing agent. He does a whole bunch of stuff, but one of the things he does is get, you know, deals with this stuff. So, uh, you know, you want to get an uh, a occupancy certificate so you can move into your building. Everything has been done by the book. You've broken no laws, blah, blah, blah. But you won't get the occupancy certificate. 
So what do you do? What you do is you outsource the entire real estate and facilities management to the company. He deals with it. You never ask any questions. <laughs> so that's sort of how most companies have to deal with it. The biggest problem is not you having to pay bribes. It's your employees taking bribes. Okay? And that has become extraordinarily rampant. And it's not just at lower levels and mid-levels. It's all the way up to the top. And I think that's what companies have to truly safeguard themselves against. And many, many companies are struggling with it. So there's one question I want to ask you on the thing you just said. One of the experiences which uh, I experienced in one of the companies that uh, we were running, you know, this person was making almost $200,000 a year. And he had the guts to cheat for $25,000 basically creating a ring around bribery and all that, and it finally got caught. Why do people do that? I just, it's just beyond me to figure out that people actually do it, and then well, when it happened, we said, I can't understand it. That's true, not only in India, though. <laughs> but it only happened in our business in India, yeah. and it happened in one of the other Asian countries as well. Sure. But it was there it was for a larger amount, so I can understand that still. But <laughs> here, trying to say, a person makes $200,000 a year, and he's willing to go for $25,000? Yeah, I, I don't have a degree in psychology. <laughs> but, you know, why did Rajat Gupta do what he did? Yeah. Why did he put everything he had built over a lifetime uh, and lose it for something so inconsequential? I, I, that's why I don't understand human nature. But I would say there's a sense of infallibility. You don't believe you'll get caught. Even if you get caught, you believe the consequences are going to be negligible. And, and you got hired again. And, and every, exactly. The consequences are negligible. Everybody around you is participating in this grand party. So why not? So the problem is today, corruption is no longer just in one part of society. It's no longer just in the government. Uh, it has spread to where you know, the whole well has got poisoned. Is all absolutely pervasive. And this is true in all emerging markets. I was in China most of last week, and it's exactly the same out there. It's just quite tragic. Who has a mic? Hi, my name is Parth, and I come from the land of Narendra Modi. So, anyways, uh, the question I have is you, you mentioned about the example of McDonald's cracking the code after about eight years. So when you took over at Microsoft and you explained the pricing differential model, you guys have a lot of challenges initially, and and if yes, how do you solve it? You know, is there much more than only the pricing differential model that you introduced, and how much time did people take to adapt to it? And and on the same lines, uh, you know, I, we keep reading here in the newspapers, on the internet about while there's a lot of talent in India, there are reports that come out from the, the Picky and you know th those kind of organizations that say that 90% of the talent is not employed. So uh, you know I'm trying to relate the two because <laughs> India grew a lot in seven years. So did the corruption. And on on the same note, you know there's always this, every second day you have an article which says great talent, but you know 90% not employed. So yeah. I mean, that's kind of my question. Thank you. I'd rather take the second question than not the first. <coughs> So the Microsoft thing, it's obviously not just a single uh, thing that did the trick. It was a set of uh, actions. But India is this sort of land of paradoxes and contradictions, right? You've got an abundance of people and a shortage of labor. And it's true of every kind of thing. Uh, do you know if you want to buy an industrial robot today, how, what, what is the waiting time? Three months. That means the country has an insatiable appetite for simple industrial robots. Why? Because if you're a factory, you can't find labor. If you have a farm, you can't find farm hands. In a country of 1.25 billion people, okay, what has gone wrong out here? What has gone wrong is bad politics has created a welfare society. Okay? the center and the states are competing and falling over each other trying to give away more for people to stay at home and do nothing. Okay? 
So you have the National Rural Employee Guarantee Act, so people get a minimum wage for staying at home. Uh, now we've got a Food Security Act, so you get uh, food, 65% of the population is eligible to get food, free of cost. Every state government gives free rice, free television, so you can stay at home and watch television. Okay? <laughs> So we've created, in a desperately poor country, a welfare society where people don't want to work. They don't need to work. And so productive enterprises are really struggling to find labor. This is not the knowledge work I'm talking, which, mm. which I'm coming to. Knowledge worker issue is simple. Large numbers, very poor quality education systems, so companies have to go and do the remedial stuff after hiring. Uh, you know, and that, that's what the issue is. But there's you know, quite a large amount of uh, really smart people who are willing to work, and I think the challenge is sifting through it. But the voting will force these people to be on the payroll, I mean, on, the, on these roles, or would it ever change? I don't know. This election somehow feels more important than almost any election since 1975. Maybe the Lando part will change that. <laughs> That's what at least I'm sure he's hoping for. Uh, thank you, by the way, for spending your time with us, uh, especially after getting on such a long flight. Um, one uh, question that I have, I mean, all your advice, by the way, is geared towards CEOs who want to set up shops in India. What's your advice to the rest of us folk? I mean, you were lucky enough when you were in Cummins to Get the, gain the trust of Jim Henderson and Tim Salter and all these guys, because I worked at Cummins as well at that time. Uh, and it was pretty desperate times in 99, I remember that time. Yeah. Uh, how did you gain that trust for you to go and manage the India operation? Yeah, there's a tremendous secret to it, actually. <laughs> you know, I became a CEO at an extraordinarily young age. And the only reason is nobody else wanted the job. <laughs> wow. That's the honest truth. In 1996, um, I had the opportunity to go run a very large joint venture with, with, that Cummins had with Tata Motors. At, until that time, I had led a team of four people. Wow. Okay? And, and now, this was you know, two orders of magnitude greater and five orders gr gr magnitude greater in complexity. I was all of 31 years old. Why did I get the job? Because nobody else wanted to go live in Jamshedpur. <laughs> okay, that was one. Second is, when I took the job, the CEO, Tim Solso, called me and he said, listen, uh, you know, we actually think well of you. Why are you doing this? <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, well, I want to be, you know, build a business. I want to be home, blah, all those things. He said, listen, let, let's get this clear. This is a joint venture that uh, is probably going to have to be closed. And your mission is not to say that. Your mission is to make sure that when it's closed, it doesn't cost us a lot of money. <laughs> okay, so there was no upside. It was all about <laughs> limiting downside. <laughs> but I, you know, I was young and foolish, and I, uh, I hadn't seen the Steve Jobs Stanford address at that point in time, but I was young <laughs> and foolish. And I went in there anyway, and things worked out, and it became quite a success. But that really is <laughs> the honest truth of why I ended up where I did. But what, what is your advice to those of us who are not fortuitous enough? I mean, it no, is I, not, not an undiscovered secret anymore. My, my advice to sort of people who are early in their careers or even middle in the middle of their careers is to take more risk. You know, as you get older and you look back at your life, the thing you regret is not the risk that you took that blew up. and then It's the risk that you didn't take. Okay? And so it's really, really important to constantly sort of challenge yourself and put yourself out of your comfort zone, take big risks in pursuit of your dreams, whatever that is. Might be to start a business, might be to you know, do something as wacko as I'm doing, writing a book in a late evening and talking to a bunch of gentlemen out here. Whatever it is, you, you should reinvent yourself profoundly from time to time. That would be the advice I give. I mean, there are some successful Indian companies, you know, who have conquered yeah. the chaos, and they make pretty healthy margins uh, selling airtime at less than one minute. Yeah. What comes in the way of them succeeding globally? And some of them are successful globally, but what comes in the way of Indian companies? It's a great
great question. It's this, you've all heard it. The issues that Indian companies face and Chinese companies face as they globalize are exactly the same that you know, the Western multinationals face going in there. Right? So take Indian IT services companies. They come to America, they operate exactly like Indian companies. Okay, so 80% of the workforce will be Indian. The head will be Indian. Their HR policies are Indian. All decisions are made in Mumbai or Bangalore or somewhere out there. It's exactly the same issues in reverse. So guess how Americans feel or Europeans feel, okay? They don't, this is not an aspirational sort of set of companies to work for, okay? So you can't get an, the best talent and hold on to them. Number two, the governments in these countries say, hey, here's a giant vacuum cleaner coming and taking jobs away. So let's do, put something in place. That's exactly how the Indian government sees Coke and Pepsi and <laughs> Walmart and so on and so forth. So the challenge for all our companies, Indian and Chinese, as we globalize, is you know, paradoxically to be more local, to be, to be more American in America, more German in Germany, etc. I think that's, do all those kinds of things. Indian companies become globally, com becoming globally competitive. My question is, uh, when will, uh, uh, do you think it's going to become more of a level playing field in India with, uh, with the new investment? I, I think the biggest uh, problem for uh, Indian companies uh, is the lack of capital, probably, to compete with the uh, outside companies, multinationals. Do you see that changing with uh, new forms of investment coming up? Or is that uh, something we can look forward to in uh, the next book? No, I, I, the level playing field in India, yes. in the Indian market. See, there are certain uh, industries which are protected. If you're in insurance, if you're in retail, there, you know there is some. It's a not not a level playing field yet. But in the vast majority of industry, it is a level playing field. Okay, it's a level um, hostile field. It's okay. equal ho equally hostile for Indian and foreign companies. And so I I, I don't see that as a fundamentally different so I, I don't even sort of relate to your question all that well. No, uh, um, the question is more like, uh, you say uh, Indian companies that are more familiar with the uh, with, ethos over there yeah. should ideally be more successful than, uh, if the competitiveness wasn't a factor, they should be more successful than multinationals trying to adopt to India, right? Yeah. But it seems like uh, <coughs> Indian companies that succeed are a few that uh, have always been around for a while and uh, unlike the American dream we talk about, or like Silicon Valley, where anyone can start a business and become an entrepreneur, uh, will that change in India ever? Or? Well, first of all, when liberalization happened in 1991, a heck of a lot of Indian firms went out of business. Okay, they just couldn't compete. And by 2000, it was game over for lots of them. Okay? So, so there's one level of pruning that went on. What has sadly happened is that, the, you know, for a while there was a lot of entrepreneurship and companies like Infosys and Wipro and all came up and, you know, truly sort of entrepreneurial, global, competitive things. But the vast majority of success has actually gone to firms that have, you know, played the oligarchic capitalism game. You know, the license Raj gave way to what is called resource Raj. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, that party has to come to an end. Um, it still remains a ferociously difficult place for startup activity. Okay, I don't know how many of you are involved with startups in India, but it is exceedingly hard going. And somehow we've got to reduce the amount of friction uh, that does these uh, early stage companies face. I think his question also is talking about uh, the lack of capital that the local companies face yeah. versus the multinational, how does it hamper their success and do you see that changing? Yeah, you know, I don't know about this lack of capital issue. Okay, I don't fully understand. 
So you don't believe there is a lack of capital? I don't. I think there are too many pedestrian ideas mm. seeking capital and backed by people who don't have a track record that is worth betting on. You know, some colleagues of mine, we've put together a $15 million fund just for early stage social enterprises, firms that are fundamentally about doing good with a profit model. And it is damn hard to make these $100,000 investments, okay? There are lots of people queuing up for it. It's no shortage of, the pipeline is not uh, empty. But the, the uniqueness of the idea, mm. the track record of the entrepreneur, et cetera, is not sort of particularly exciting. And so I think that is a very significant part of the, the problem, okay? That there is a fun, private equity in India is desperate to find places to invest. They just can't find it, okay? So I'm talking about now the true growth stage capital, okay? The VCs for a while were behaving more like private equity guys. You know, what is what business does Sequoia have investing in a, co a coffee day, cafe coffee day? So I think it's the real shortage of ideas and really competent yeah. entrepreneurs, that's the big issue, okay? But I could be wrong, I'm not an expert, no, I would completely agree with you. I mean, last 11 months I've been spending in the venture capital space trying to raise capital. I completely agree with you. That's right. That the capital is abundant. It's the lack of talent. Ideas. Uh, ideas. Stuff. Yeah, yeah everybody wants to build, build some crappy online Me too. Uh, retail <laughs> business. Me too okay. kind of thing. But I think, uh, so I remember I was in a, um, sorry, this is all the I was in a Thai <laughs> meeting in uh, Hyderabad uh, and there was a gentleman who came over and he kind of summed it up, and I don't know if that is culturally still true. This is about eight to 10 years ago. He says, uh, you know, we had one of the guys from Norwest Ventures who gave this great speech, you know, you guys should all become entrepreneurs. You should, you know, leave your family behind. And, you know, this is how Silicon Valley was built. This is how you have to build it. And this gentleman over dinner says to him, saying, look, I think you don't understand it's about marriage. Okay. And it's about marriage. Oh. So he says, what do you mean? He says, when a young man finds a job, his first thing is to find a wife. <laughs> and getting a good wife really depends on him working in a good company. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and therefore, his incentive is not to become an entrepreneur, but his incentive is to find a job in a good company. <laughs> Once he has a job in a good company, the in-laws put enough pressure on him to stay in a good company or a better company. <laughs> and so a lot of the talented people, therefore, never leave their comfort and really become entrepreneurs. I don't know how true that is, but this is sort of the sum up that this guy said, which I sort of tended to believe in. Yeah, but I, this is probably true, but the question is, when has it been really that different? Okay? No, so, it has not so been different. Uh, I'm just saying that culturally, culture. it probably doesn't lend itself to the entrepreneurship as a result no, in the a bigger way. the good thing is I'm finding the in, the, um, amongst the younger people a much greater willingness to take risks it is becoming somewhat okay to take risks and fail and dust yourself off and try to, the stigma of, of failure is gradually becoming less and less. And I think even this marriage issue is, feels slightly overplayed to me. If you're a risk-taking young person, uh, you're not going to be highly persuaded by this line of reasoning. Uh, and so, stay single, stay hungry. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> Yeah, hi, mm -hmm. uh, my name is Sanjay. Uh, thanks for the presentation. The question I had is, uh, in the examples you have uh, told about Cummins and Borgo, right, coming and establishing their markets in India, uh, is the R&D work gets done in India or elsewhere? And does our Indian <coughs> high-end talent pool providing to that effect? Yeah. Well, you can come up with a brand new sachet to sell a product. Yeah. So what generally happens to these companies? What is their thought process when they've come and... The ones who are... It's a great question. I think you absolutely must get a book. The, the, in the companies that do it right, the innovation happens close to the customer, that means in the market. But it is not done only by Indians. Okay? It's done by global teams that leverage know-how from anywhere within the system, but to solve sort of particularly sort of interesting, hard local problems. Okay, so Volvo's come up with a finally an emerging market truck. 
And the truck has been developed by a team of engineers from Sweden who bring sort of the high-end stuff. Japan from Nissan Diesel who understand quality processes and all that. And the Indians who bring the frugal engineering mindset. So it is the combination that has created this. It's the same at Deer, same at Cummins, etc. There are almost no good examples of tech companies in my book. And that's, uh, and I was really quite depressed by it because I tried hard. And what I found is tech companies have a great arrogance that, you know, the, we, will, we, we, we will build one, pr one product and uh, it's got to fit the whole world. And all, the locus of that innovation has to be at the headquarters. Okay? And I, I don't know, uh, Mohan, what do you think about IBM well, I mean, or not? Yeah, I, mean, <laughs> I really am asking an open question. But I could not find amongst any of the technology companies a willingness to adapt products for local markets. Well, the, the, the way I used to feel about this, I, I used to be the IBM India chief scientist for almost three years, so I struggled through some of these sorts of issues, right? Oh. Um, so my original thing was, uh, even the IBM India Research Lab guys and so on, they always look westward okay. for uh, customer involvement. I'm like, what's wrong with you guys? Now that the market is reasonably sized in India, or in the neighborhood, why not work with the local customers and so on? But still, it, it is a hard task for these guys who have not grown up with senior talent right around them to you know, be able to do stuff that requires a lot more deeper knowledge and so on. And the thing that bothered me most was the fact that people were not staying technical long enough. And unless you sort of imbibe the problems and all that, even the solutions may be obvious, but the problem statements themselves won't sort of stare at you on the face. Yeah. That's where I think bulk of the problems are, even with Synfosys and so on. They've had their attempts at labs and such, but they haven't come out with anything great. So they're all happy with doing the time yeah, and materials kind of work rather than Very paradoxically, work. I found tech to be in the dark ages, mm -hmm. that the consumer products and industrial companies have gone far ahead in terms of figuring out how to drive innovation for these markets. Uh, so. There is actually a problem with that. I mean, I, and I'll just speak for Cisco because that's where I work now. Uh, even when we do innovate and create those products, which we do, by the way, we want to keep it well hidden from the rest of the market because we don't want uh, something like, you know, what you're going to find, yeah, you don't want cannibalization and you don't want uh, channel leakage or what you build for specific markets to come back and cut your high margin product. Yeah, but you know, that's <laughs> why I say the industrial guys and the consumer guys are way ahead because they also have cannibalization worries, okay? So for instance, take these, the construction equipment uh, business that Volvo is in. The Chinese, uh, uh, company, Lingong, co has come up with excavators, wheel loaders, etc., which are about 80% as good for half the price. Okay? So the qu they should be worried mm -hmm. about this, because even the developed country guys are going to say, let me have the Chinese mm -hmm. thing instead of the gold-plated one. So they have a very elegant strategy of two brands. You've got oh, a premium brand with a premium price and all that stuff, and you've got this one. And they do a lot of thoughtful work about features and, and differentiation. And they offer both. And so you've vastly expanded the market. Mm. On the margin, there is some cannibalization. But if you play your brand strategy well, you're you know, uh, overall much, much, much better off. Tech companies are so paranoid that they refuse to even experiment and consider these kinds of ideas. So anyway. Yeah, so my, my question to you is, you, you focused on, I don't know how much in your book you focused on traditional businesses. All of the things you've been talking about are large global brands going into India. What I'm interested in is new startups going to India doing digital. So yeah, there's a specific reason why I'm asking the question, because you know, if you wanted to launch a digital brand in India and from scratch, with funding, with funding, you know, how do you, is that possible? You know, given all the things that you've already said. So obviously I didn't focus on those kinds of companies in the book, but my own experience is it's very much possible. There's a whole bunch of startups out there uh, who are attempting it. Now, I think there are extraordinarily interesting opportunities, but there is also, as I said, a lot of headwinds 
for any startup, uh, where is Mr. Reddy? Uh, of, uh, you, know, you know what Red Bus has yeah. uh, gone through, and it wasn't always easy, is it, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so there are, there are challenges which you have to manage through, but I think there are equally uh, abundant opportunities. So I wouldn't, there are certain spaces which I wouldn't attempt right now. Like? Sorry? Give like what? E-commerce. Why? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a very, 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 uh, I think structurally they're real problems, right? So you've got this problem where, you know, there's no uh, credit, uh, credit card transactions. So everything is cash on delivery. You don't have a logistic system. So you've got an army of people you have to employ on buzzing around on mopeds collecting cash. And you've got to manage that system. The amount of the percentage of returns is stunningly high compared to a developed market. So I mean, it's just and yeah. So most of these guys. So it's just there are certain businesses which are worth pursuing and some that are probably right so now. Flipkart just raised. Flipkart just yeah. raised three hundred fifty million dollars. Yeah. yeah. In India. You know, good for them. No, but what I'm saying is, you from what. You were saying, well, are they raising more money is not equal to success. No, Flipkart has already sort of emerged, right? They, they, they've broken through the clutter and they've reached a certain critical mass. They still haven't found a path to profitability. And very possibly they're playing a valuation game, which is very different from building a sustainable business. I don't know. But all I'm saying is that the odds of a, a startup right now getting into that space and getting terribly far is a bit bit low. But on the other hand, you're talking about digital media, and I suspect that there's enormous opportunity. So on that question, uh, let me just uh, sort of ask you a question, Ravi, as a follow-on to the same one. Uh, a lot of your advice was for all the bigger companies. Or mid-size. Mid-size companies, but the amount of investment that you said is needed for probably most startups it's not viable. So should they stay away from India market at all for now, or what would you recommend? Hmm. He gets a book, huh? Yeah, actually, very good question. Very good question. Because, you know, most of the entrepreneurs here are from startups as well. So. And we struggled with it when I did my last startup. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I, I think it depends a lot on what space you're in. Okay? So, for instance, I, I think anything to do with social enterprise is very, 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 very fertile space. Okay? Raising ranging from skills, skills development, to uh, you know, providing all kinds of services, solar lanterns, this, that, and the other, drinking water solutions, healthcare solutions. So that whole space is just extraordinarily sort of ripe and lots of possibilities out there. I think the healthcare medical devices uh, sort of opportunity is quite enormous. Education is a bit crowded, but even there, there's quite a lot uh, of room. So it depends on what kind of company you're talking about. Uh, if you're trying to do enterprise software, <laughs> I wouldn't do it. <laughs> you know? so, uh, because, uh, yeah, your back end might very well be there and so forth. But my, the market is clearly not in India. Okay? So it, it's a more nuanced answer. But maybe what you, you were very enthusiastically jumping. Uh, uh, do you have a different perspective? No, I was about to ask a question. No, no, no. The, the guy behind you. Uh, pretty much the same, actually. Yeah. Sorry. So, so pretty much the same, actually. But uh, I would say that the, for, for the startups, uh, yeah, so for the startups, uh, I think it's a very tricky question because uh, the medium businesses and the large businesses come with a lot of money. But uh, in the startups, uh, I, again, actually, I, I guess it's, it's, it's tough for everybody. As, as one of the gentlemen asked, that what it is, what, how we, what, what way it is different for small businesses uh, versus a local player. I guess it's the same answer. It's it's the yeah. it's but the stuff for everybody, and uh, we have to figure out the nuances. Get it as simple as it's safe for startups. But the problem is that anything to get anything done in India will take you two to three times as long as it as you planned for. And if you run out of cash in that period, it's a mm -hmm. serious problem. So that's why it's, it's you need to be slightly well funded. Uh, so uh, let me share uh, two of my experiences in two different startups, which might help sort of lace, put some light into it. So in one of the startups, we were 
very well funded. And so we decided to go into India. We were selling a telecom equipment, voice over IP equipment. And as luck had it, our first customer signed up very quickly, but actually never delivered. I mean, never actually deployed the service because they had KPN as a partner and it's same kind of situation. Uh, but fortunately for us, we won the second deal with Reliance. And we were one of the few startups who actually got cash out of them. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, that was kind of done at a very low price compared to the market. But gaining credibility of having been deployed at Reliance was then easy enough for us to go into other customers. Sure. And we kind of stuck in the market for a while. We never succeeded in selling to the government because that was a very complex sale and required a lot of the other things that we were not willing to do as a culture. But we did succeed, you know, with a good three year cycle sure. that finally it's about a five to $10 million business. In the second company where we were selling a, you know, essentially a, uh, a web service or a mobile service where we thought, okay, India is a huge numbers. You go to Reliance and Reliance shows you, hey, I got you know, 10 million, 20 million numbers and you think, okay, even a 10 cent would be pretty reasonable. But the amount of cost you have to spend to get any mind share, because they are not going to, it's just far exceed the money you will ever make. Mm -hmm. So we decided to walk out of the market and said, this is not for us at this point will be wasting too much money. The so subtitle of my book is Win in India, Win Everywhere. <laughs> I.e. the ch challenge is enormous, but if you can pull it off, you've got a whole set of capabilities that uh, make any other market seem like a walk okay. in the park. So we, will, we won in Indonesia, we won in Malaysia, but couldn't win in India. And then we decided it was not worth the money wastage. Mm. Even though the volumes are large, yeah. it's better to walk out now than to run out of money five years later and say. But to be fair, money. the answer is again, dependent very much on what business you're looking yeah. at. Okay, if you look at this this month's issue of HPR, November issue, has an article by Vijay Govind Rajan on yeah. innovation in Indian healthcare. It's worth reading, okay? It's extraordinary. And they are all successful profit-making examples that he cites. So I think it depends on what sure. business, is, business you're in. Um, Sorry, oh. yeah. Why are we not uh, doing good at the manufacturing? You know, oh, right? don't get me started on that. <laughs> you get, uh, now everybody yeah. wants to get into IT and other services, right? No, uh, the, we, okay. if we don't get our act together uh, as a manufacturing nation, we're going to have a s catastrophe, right? We have 750 million people still on farms. Agricultural productivity is actually rising at a reasonable rate. And so you you really need to get people off farms into cities. And that means you need a manufacturing sector. And we're creating no manufacturing jobs. There's no investment going into manufacturing. So if we don't solve this problem, we've got an absolute disaster. Now, what is it going to take to do that? It's profound. It's not simple. right? So what do you need? Manufacturing needs infrastructure. Now, first of all, it needs land acquisition. A factory needs Problem. space. And that is, even after the new land acquisition bill, it's not at all trivial to acquire land. You need infrastructure. You can't produce, you know, generate electricity using diesel generator sets at 20 rupees a unit and compete with anyone else. Okay, roads, ports, all that stuff. You need labor laws that, you know, allow you to have a productive workforce. None of these things exist. So I think, you know, the, one of the most important challenges for the next government is actually, you know, fixing the barriers for manufacturing to take off. However, I'm very optimistic. When I was running Cummins, we could produce an identical engine and land it in China cheaper than the Ch our sister plant in China. Oh, wow. Okay, so that that was a B series engine. It was a K, you know, uh, uh, K38, K50 series engines, 3850 liter engines. We could land it cheaper in China. So I think India does have certain inherent strengths, but we're not able to scale it um, because of these kinds of policy issues. And we have to fix that. Yeah. So three uh, more but questions. No, but he gets a good, good uh, he got a book. Oh, you got a book. <laughs>
Any more you. questions? So I had a question about education. I mean, one thing you mentioned which really caught my eye, I think that's always bothered me, is that uh, we have a lot of people working really hard, studying really hard, right, in the education system, and yet at the end, we have people that are basically not, not, uh, not skilled for the workforce, right? That's one thing you mentioned, that we have a lot of people, but we don't have labor, but they're not skilled enough. It's just something seems to be radically wrong with the education system, when there's so many people working yeah. so hard and paying so much money and working yeah. tuitions, classes, but at the end, they're not really qualified. So do you have any ideas for solving that problem? No, the, once again, it comes, like everything in India, solving every problem in India, uh, you have to look at incentives, okay? Um, and the problem in the education system in India is it has, it is run by politicians. Okay, but I know you're from Pune, and in Maharashtra in particular, uh, every politician has a university. Okay, Thanks. every politician has a university. They are all not-for-profit universities. I.e., they have got a business model worked out that allows them to to do whatever it is. Now, uh, you charge a huge amount of money for admissions, and you've got an you know. Uh, large pool of people to select from, and you have to do nothing, okay? And how is this going to change? By only opening it up to competition, including allowing foreign universities to come in if necessary, etc. But what, if, you make, if you're a politician who's controlling the policies, why would you end your nice little cozy game, okay? So every problem in India is uh, persisting only because of the perversion of incentives. That self-interest of the political class is trumping national interest. So if we, the solution to every one of our problems is fix governance. If we don't fix governance or don't make a dent in that, we don't have a country that's worth talking about. That's so how, how do we innovate to incentivize the politicians to change? That is the question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's actually a more complicated ecosystem problem. There aren't enough teachers who have the credentials to do the teaching and all that. A lot of these universities no, but, so called. But honestly, if you fix it, 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 it's supply and demand, man. If you fix the uh, incentive issue, you've got more people coming in. They're willing to pay good wages for teachers. You would, over a period of time, develop more yeah, but teachers. You, yeah, but that will take a while. It'll, That's it'll, the it point. It may take right? five years, it may take t uh, ten years, whatever it is. If takes. you want faculty with PhDs, there aren't enough PhDs being produced in India. So it's a whole... We can change that problem overnight by sucking the Indian PhDs here so that's and getting issue. them excited about going back. So that's but, what but, it's, but that's not an attractive proposition today. Yeah. So yeah. if you make it attractive, we can solve any of these problems. Over a period of time. Over a reasonably short yeah. period of time. Because we're talking, even 10 years is only a blink of an yeah. eye when we're talking about these issues. So I, I keep coming back to, I think we have one very, very fundamental pernicious problem, and that is fixing governance. And that's what we have to deal with. You have one here. Hey, it's on. It's on. Thank you. Hey, Ravi, um, great set of uh, ideas you've been uh, discussing. Uh, I want to just, for a moment, uh, take on the counter-argument from, or contradiction apparent in the, you know, thoughts that you've expressed here, which is to say, that if a player has to be number one or number two or number three within the India market and has to be also achieving 15, 20% global market leadership, those are kind of uh, contradiction, uh, contradictory statements in the sense that if you look at the statistics, and if you look at the money flow, if you look at the consumption as well as the income of the world, uh, then what happens is that the counter argument is more powerful, which is to say, that instead of investing in India for so many years and expecting the markets to yield and grow the market uh, over there and so forth and therefore learn the lessons and becoming an emerging market player, all of those are great arguments. But the counter argument versus the argument, so to speak, I want to have you visit that once more because the counter argument is that if you go where the consumption of the world is, if you go where the GDPs of the world are, if you take the example of China versus India, China of course, has taken the um, tack of 
uh, let's go address world markets. For example, sure. let's go uh, invest into you know Africa. <laughs> let's go invest into America. Let's go export into America and so forth. And has become a powerfully successful model. And here we are saying you know let's use the common I mean argument in this case, which is to say go to India and do all these things, suffer through all the hardships, uh, five ten years of you know patient. Hey, growth. I'm sorry, I have to cut you off. What I, in the book I give a example, a story of a shoe, two shoe salesmen who go to, let's say India or Africa or whatever. Okay, they land up there and they, one guy, just, you know, is in despair and he comes back, says to his boss, "There's no market out there. These Indians, they don't wear shoes." The other guy stays back and he says. This is a fantastic market. Nobody wears shoes. I'm staying. I'm staying on. You send me a container full of cheap shoes. So the opportunity is in markets where there is lack of consumption. Okay, not where people are already on their thirtieth pair of shoes. The trick for multinational companies is to figure out how to create that market. Okay, and when you do that, there's enormous demand. Right. Look at Nokia's success in India between 99 and 2008. Spectacular. This Be is the bottom of the pyramid. No, you? middle of the pyramid. I don't buy the bottom yet because I think <laughs> bottom is sort of really marginal. But that middle of the pyramid opportunity in India is huge. And then once you crack India, there's a whole host of guys who look pretty damn similar. Okay, that's my point. And and the answer isn't either or for a company. Okay, for a global company, it's and. Of course, you have to service the demand in the developed markets like the U.S. Okay, that's how you, you know, uh, that's your horizon one. That's your short-term opportunity. But if you fail to pay attention to this medium-term opportunity in countries like India, you're really toast. Some of it's, you're going to lose out to a competitor. That's what I was saying. Okay. I agree with you. Only thing is, like, if you look at the statistics of Indian-based companies, I think we got to move on. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, we got to move on. Uh, last, last question. question, question the next question. Last uh, one. Yeah. So, <clears throat> uh, I guess argument and counter argument. Uh, the the question I had was more on life rather than business. So, in you know, what made you stay? I mean, we are talking about suffering in India. I mean, yeah. I was there in December, and there is a lot of energy and there is a lot of warmth. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, you stayed for a long time, and clearly yeah. there was a pull, right? There, it, it's just yeah. not maybe money. So, what what was it? And it's home. <laughs> it is home. Uh, you know, I love the U.S. I'm bi truly bicultural. I still have my green card. I still pay taxes in both places. But uh, that's where I feel, you know, uh, most at home. And the point, I also reached a point where I say that if every person leaves, you know, or just focuses on their own interests, who's going to look after, you know, the, the, the societal challenges? Some number of us have to do that. I'm not being preachy or idealistic. I think each one of us has to, you know, make our own choices and live with it. And you know, this is how I chose. But I feel sort of very, 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 for the most part, I feel very happy uh, in that society, that culture, in a way that I don't quite find as fulfilling in any other place. Even though the standards of living, the ease of living, is much, much superior uh, outside. Okay. Um, I'd like to give this book to somebody who didn't ask a question, but who really uh, puts in a lot of effort uh, for us, and that's Dan. Ah, Dan, Dan. Dan has one of the most extraordinary um, sort of memories and recollections. He remembered every previous encounter of us, and so I, <laughs> I'm quite amazed. So let's uh, give a big hand uh, to Thank Ravi you for. Thank you very much. Cheers. Dadim, Ginako, 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 Dadim, Ginako,
Dividend, 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 Dividend,